Hello, Sean McMahon here. This is part four of our First Thessalonians chapters four through five study. Of course, these are the rapture chapters, and we're talking a little bit about what St. Paul is actually saying in these chapters of First Thessalonians. Now, we're going to dive right in, but before we do, I want to remind you, please like and subscribe and turn on notifications to these videos. And if you like what you're hearing, make sure you check out some of the other studies, because these are all kind of interconnected based on successive questions that people have offered previous studies I've done. Now, without further ado, we're going to dive right in. So we're going to start looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. So let's read this in full. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of our hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to suffer wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen carefully. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. This is important. This is the mind-blowing part. Therefore, encourage and build one another up just as you already doing. Okay, so think about what Paul just said. Whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Now, think about everything we just learned in the previous parts about the meaning of awake versus asleep. One way or another, those who are asleep are not faithful Christians, okay? Nonetheless, Paul is saying that they may live together with him. Well, why and how is this possible? Well, because Jesus died for us in order that it may be so. Now, once again, 1 John chapter 2 has a parallel for this. His parallel is in verse 1 and verse 2. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, listen here, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. All right, so do you see what these two apostles are both saying? They're saying Jesus died for everyone, not just those who are awake, who are sons of light and of the day, but also for those who sleep, who are drunk, who are sons of darkness and the night. Is this really so surprising? Because in short, all this says is Christ died for sinners. Just like it says in Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And yet, we don't always remember that everyone is a sinner, right? We don't always remember everyone is a sinner. But this is what John in his first epistle and Paul in 1 Thessalonians is trying to remind us of and to open our minds to realize that God's love embraces the unfaithful as well so that we may live together with him, right? Therefore, he says, encourage and build one another up just as you are already doing, okay? And so we should too. We need to remind people of God's grace and encourage and build one another up in light of God's grace. And I love these words of Paul because they're so gentle and, and they're so charitable, but they should also sound kind of familiar, shouldn't they? Remember when we pointed out that the way Paul is punctuating his little secondary parenthesis in chapter 5 is almost exactly the same way he punctuated chapter 4, and that this indicates an intentionally parallel structure, right? Almost forgot about that, didn't you? Well, here comes the potentially most mind-blowing part then, interpreting chapter 4 in light of chapter 5. Let's go back and read the chapter 4 passage again. Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve like the rest who are without hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now let's stop there. Now we should really be thinking deeply when we read the word sleep. There is nowhere here any overt statement that this is about dead people, is there? And now we have a much richer understanding of what it means to be asleep, according to the apostles and Jesus himself, right? So we should also now more readily see the pattern Paul is making in bringing up Christ's death in relation to this subject. Just like 1 John chapter 2, where he assures that Christ died not just for brothers, but for the whole world. And more specifically, just like 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul says that Jesus died so that those who are awake and those who are asleep may live together with him, okay? It's the same exact statement when Paul says here, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, okay? Same exact statement. Are you ready to dive deeper? 
By the word of the Lord, we declare to you that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. Aha! Now this is where Paul introduces life and death language. We who are alive, he says. Okay, folks. Now it's finally time to dive into this one. We're going for it. What is the connection between life and death with these other concepts Paul is connecting with them? Light and darkness, night and day, awake and asleep, because he's clearly equating them. Well, luckily, we see these terms connected in a very explicit way by none other than Jesus himself. And he does this in John chapter 11. He's heard that Lazarus is sick and he says, well, let's head to Judea. And his disciples say, listen, are you crazy? They're going to kill you there. And check out what Jesus says, okay? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? If anyone walks in the daytime, he will not stumble, because he sees by the light of this world. But if anyone walks at night, he will stumble, because he has no light. Okay, so he's talking about light and darkness. Got it? Now look where he goes from here. Verse 11, After he had said this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Okay? Sleep. He brought up sleep. Verse 12 and following. His disciples replied, Lord, if he is sleeping, he'll get better. They thought that Jesus was talking about actual sleep, but he was talking about the death of Lazarus. Okay. So, there you have it. Sleep equals death. But listen, that's not the end of the story, because even though Jesus tells them plainly that Lazarus is dead, nonetheless, he told them that Lazarus' sickness would not end in death in verse 4. Remember that? Was he lying? No, Jesus obviously does not lie. And we know what happens next. Jesus raises Lazarus, okay? But there's some juicy teaching before he does. Check it out. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told Martha. Martha replied, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So please take note, Martha invoked the last day. That's the subject matter of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, isn't it? Now watch how Jesus answers when she brings this up. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You know, hold up. Everyone who lives and believes in Jesus will never die? Well, didn't all the apostles die? Didn't all the most saintly of saints die? Don't all Christians die? So once again, is Jesus lying? No, Jesus doesn't lie. So, how is it that the faithful never die? How is it that the faithful never die? Well, what exactly is death? Let's ask the Bible. The wages of sin is... Bing, bing, bing. Death, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. Death is the cost of sin, in other words. Sin and death, therefore, are inextricably linked. Paul goes further to say, in 1 Corinthians 15.56, The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is the law. The law. Now, this is interesting. He's interpreting Hosea 3.14, by the way. It said there, I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh grave, is your sting? So this passage of Hosea, this is God's promise to redeem the people from death. And that he did, of course, in Christ. Now watch how Paul describes the redemption in Colossians 1, 13-14. He says, that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Whoa, 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 darkness. Doesn't that sound familiar now? He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have, ding, 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 redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Aha! So, he shows here that forgiveness and redemption are equal. According to Paul, forgiveness and redemption are equal. They are theological synonyms. Okay, so these pieces solve the puzzle. Jesus is able to say, whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, because Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And if the sting of death is sin, and sins are forgiven, then death cannot sting those who are forgiven. Follow? Okay, but how is Jesus able to say, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die? 
never die. Okay, well, the answer lies in the second half of 1 Corinthians 15, 56. And the power of the sin is the law. Right? The power of sin is the law. What does this mean? If the law is removed, then so is the power of sin. And where sin has no power, death has no sting. Where death has no sting, it can be said that death has been defeated. Now, Paul taught that the last enemy is death in 1 Corinthians 15. This entire chapter covers the same themes as 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. Now, at the time Paul was writing 1 Corinthians 15, Hosea's prophecy had not yet been fulfilled. But what Paul says is, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Okay? He says that's when that will happen. That's when Hosea will come true. Well, how would that come to pass? Well, look what Paul says. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Right? Are we surprised to hear Paul talk about sleep at this point? <laughs> right? Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. So, he's saying this victory is going to come about at the last trumpet. And it's at the last trumpet that the Son of Man comes in his kingdom. Matthew 16, 28, right? Now we have to remember, this is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus said, the kingdom will not come with observation. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Likewise, Paul made a point to preface everything he just said in 1 Corinthians 15 with this reminder. Now I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So Paul is saying that when this spiritual kingdom, which cannot be inherited by flesh and blood, comes at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised, while he and those he's writing to will be changed. And it kind of sounds like Paul is saying, we'll never die, we'll only be changed, right? But it's not that simple, because according to his doctrine of the resurrection, you can't put on imperishability without perishing. Because he compares a person's mortal body to a seed. What you sow, he says, does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. And speaking more plainly, he says, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Woo-wee! First Corinthians 15 is deep. Paul also speaks plainly about where these bodies are born. Where these bodies are born. Comparing the natural body with Adam and the spiritual body with the second Adam, he says, the first man, the first Adam, was of the dust of the earth. The second man, the second Adam, from heaven. As was the earthly man, so also are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. So the spiritual bodies are born where? In heaven. And doesn't that remind you of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3? How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked, Can he enter his mother's womb a second time to be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh is born of flesh. This is just what Paul just said. Flesh is born of flesh, but Spirit is born of the Spirit. Right? It sounds exactly like Paul. The earthly man is from earth, the heavenly man is from heaven. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And so, this is what it means to never die, to be born again. To be born again is to never die. And this is the distinction between those who are asleep and those who will, as Paul says, be changed at the last trumpet. Follow me. Those who are born again as heavenly men have no need of resurrection at the last trumpet because they never died. They will only be changed. Those who are not born again, on the other hand, must be resurrected because they died. And when they are resurrected, they will be judged. And this is what Paul meant 
in 1 Thessalonians 4.14 when he said, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, this is a long one. And there's plenty more to come, so we're going to leave it off here. Guys, thanks so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and share these with your friends if you're finding these edifying. And of course, leave comments if you have questions. I'm going to try to get to them. The new year is upon us, so I'm hoping to have some time. Uh, our daughter is due any day now, so there will be a deluge of domestic duties coming my way. But I am going to be working on these studies, getting these out for you. It's almost all written, actually, so it's merely a matter of getting the time to read them to you and of course to uh to upload them which takes some time believe it or not you know i don't have the fastest internet out here in martha's vineyard Are you listening comcast <laughs> anyway i digress thank you so much for listening i hope you've had fun i hope you find this spiritually edifying god bless you peace